Min, to begin, can you say something about the subject of the book and why you wrote it? The book is about this flowering of writings by young Asian Americans. <laughs> young meaning, you know, they're, they're in their, th their 30s or 40s. Uh, and there's a sort of unprecedented number of works being published now. Um, Asian Americans haven't been known for their writing. They've been known for math or science, but not really for creative writing. But sometime in the mid-1990s, that all begins to change. You begin to really see large numbers of Asian American writers not only writing, but gaining a lot of attention. You know, um, they're being published by mainstream presses. They're winning major awards. Uh, they're getting featured in articles, uh, I mean, in reviews in major publications. Uh, they're being represented by some of the uh, most well-known literary agents. Um, and so I thought this was a very extraordinary phenomena that hasn't really been discussed as a phenomena. What, what happened to make this possible? And what are they doing in this writing? Right? How, how does the fact that they are Asian American affect what they write? Uh, so that was the main impetus behind the book. I just, I just wanted to try to make sense of this phenomenon that I thought was actually quite extraordinary, but not frequently discussed. The book has a very specific title, the Children of 1965. Can you explain this title, please? Yes. Uh, it's, the title of the book is Children of 1965. Um, in that year, uh, Congress passed what's known as the Immigration and Nationality Act, uh, which liberalized uh, immigration law to the United States. Um, before 1965, there were very tight constraints on who could come to the U.S. as an immigrant, um, uh, almost for a whole generation, in fact, immigration to the U.S. stalled, uh, though there was still quite a bit of movement back and forth between people in, um, in Latin America and the U.S. Uh, so in 1965, uh, as part of a series of ref legal reforms that were taking place, uh, Congress decided to liberalize laws of immigration, uh, and in particular, really open the door to immigration from Asia. Um, there were two provisions in the law that were especially interesting. One um, uh, was a professional preference. The economy in the U.S. was booming in 1965. There were lots of very skilled jobs that were going wanting. Uh, and so immigration was a way in which we could fill those niches. Uh, so uh, if you're a doctor, an engineer, um, uh, a nurse, you were given preference. So there's a sort of professional preference going on. The other provision of the law was a preference given uh, to, f uh, to family members. If you had family here, uh, you were allowed to sponsor your spouse or your children uh, or your parents or your cousins, whatever. Uh, the idea being uh, that uh, the law should not prevent families from being together. And it's very much a part of a kind of family, uh, of the valuation of family that was going on and still can, goes on. Uh, when Congress debated that law, uh, a lot of the debates uh, were really sort of emphatic that this was not going to change the demographic picture of the U.S. at all, substantially, that it was still going to remain pretty much what they had in 1965. Um, they also thought it was primarily going to be a benefit to, um, if I remember correctly, um, Irish immigrants and, um, and Italian immigrants. Um, uh, who were being sort of, whose immigration was being restricted. Uh, so the lawmakers themselves, I don't think, fully appreciated what was about to happen after they passed this law, which is uh, you saw mass 
migrations of people, uh, not just from Europe, but from all over the world, and especially from Asia. Uh, and you see the number of Asians climbing rather precipitously after that. Uh, more importantly, uh, the law is selecting for particular kinds of immigrants, right? Uh, professional preference means that you've got a lot of Asian immigrants coming here as doctors, as nurses, uh, as engineers. Uh, many of them don't have very good language skills. So, so there's also this phenomena of like downward mobility that occurs with immigrants. That is, you know, you come from college-educated, professional, middle-class families back in your homeland, and you arrive here, you know, and the best job you could get maybe is a janitor. Um, uh, also, the law is encouraging people to come here, though, who are, who are also quite young. Either they have, uh, either they're married with young children, or they're young enough that when they arrive here, they'll get married and have kids. Uh, and the law is also really selecting for heterosexuals, couples, and things like that. Uh, so, so what happens then is that you've got these very educated new immigrants from Asia who are um, either starting families or have already started families when they arrive. So what I think is really interesting is that their children are the ones who then start to grab national attention in the 1980s. You know, suddenly you've got this phenomenon in the press of Asian whiz kids who are doing super well in math and science. And then starting in the 1990s, you see large numbers of Asians on college campuses at BC. Asians make up the largest Ahana population by far. Um, I believe it hovers around 10% of the student population, though that number I don't think uh, differentiates between Asian Americans and Asians who are coming just straight from Asia as international students. But in any case, Asians make up the largest Ahana population here at BC. Uh, probably uh, all the other Ahana groups combined won't equal the number of Asian students, right? Uh, so if you ask someone, why are there so many Asians in colleges? I think the response to that question is often, well, you know, it's their culture. They value family, they value education, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, as if somehow, you know, African Americans or Latinos don't value education. Um, but I think the better answer to that question, why are there so many Asians on college campuses now, is because the law selected for a particular kind of population, right? College-educated people, professional people, whose children, unsurprisingly, are going to go to colleges and universities. You know, uh, I suspect the best predictor of whether or not someone is going to go to college is if your parents went to college. And, and so, you know, it's the children of these new immigrants that came after 1965 who are not only moving into the best universities and colleges, not the only ones who are moving into professional degrees, but who are also moving into the humanities. And quite a large number of them begin to uh, write about their experiences. Uh, and to try to untangle sort of what it means for them to have been an Asian immigrant uh, and how they fit into sort of the racial schema of the U.S. Um, this is really a simple, simplified answer to something much more complex, but at least it helps us to isolate a strain of what, what has happened to make sense of the fact that uh, if you see a lot of Asians on college campuses as students, it has less to do with somehow some innate cultural f or racial factor that lends them to being good students, and more to the fact that the law has been selecting for particular kinds of immigrants. The term Asian American is often applied to the general political context. To what extent can it justifiably be applied to the more aesthetic realm of literature? Right. Uh, I think that's a really interesting and important question. Um, it's something that I've asked writers that I was writing on. I, I interviewed quite a few of them to get a sense of what it means. There was a large number of writers who felt that the term was an imposition on them, right? 
just because they happen to be of Asian ancestry, they could only write particular kind of stories. And they bristled at that. You know, they wanted more freedom. Uh, and many of them defined uh, their writing as something that uh, should be given free reign to really explore the full range of creative potential and possibility. Um, but what strikes me, I think, uh, is if you read their works as a collective body, uh, and I read over a hundred titles and drew on them explicitly, what you find is actually that you know, uh, quite a few themes keep emerging over and over again. Uh, you know, um, st starting with the obvious question of race, uh, of what it meant for them to be Asian, uh, to think uh, rather self-consciously, you know, even the decision to write a story where the main character is white or African-American is itself already to be aware of what it means for you as an Asian-American writer to write as a, you know, uh, from the perspective of a white character or of, an, of, a, of a Latino character, an African-American character. So there's a sort of hyper-awareness of race, even when it seems like they're not talking about race at all. Uh, and, and then from there, I think you see them really being concerned with a lot of very large issues that are very political in nature that are related to race, uh, but not only exclusive to race. So uh, you, I think um, there's a lot of concern about income and, income and wealth inequality that plays itself out in the literature. Uh, you see a lot of concern about technology and how that disrupts or enables social interaction. You know, some people will incorporate emails as part of the story to try to convey the sense, you know, of people uh, who live vast distances apart but nevertheless somehow maintain a connection to each other. Uh, you see uh, questions of travel and mobility, especially, you know, if you're a minority person, what does it mean for you to travel across borders? Um, one of the novels I especially liked was a novel by Sa Sahir Alam called The Groom to Have Been, uh, which, is, uh, which focuses on a group of um, uh, Muslims from Pakistan and India who are living in uh, uh, New York uh, and in Montreal after 9-11. And so part of the story is characters having to move back and forth between New York and Montreal. And you can imagine, I mean, if you're dark-skinned, if, you know, if you're Muslim, how harrowing such a trip is. And so inevitably, I think a novel like that has to think about what it meant, right? Uh, so, so questions about surveillance, uh, about security, uh, especially after 9-11, emerges as a major theme in a lot of the literature I'm looking at. Um, the other thing I thought was really interesting was uh, uh, and is a kind of growing concern with environmental issues. Um, uh, thinking about things like uh, food justice or uh, environmental disasters uh, uh, or just simply agriculture relationship to the land. These, these themes come up over and over again. And I think they come up because they're reflective of, uh, of the actual material experience of many Asian Americans that's reflected and thought through in the literature. Your book focuses on a cohort of Asian American writers who came into prominence in the 1990s, uh, mostly a younger group. Uh, what relationship do these uh, contemporary writers have with the older generation who, in effect, established the genre of Asian American literature? They aren't as young as they used to be. <laughs> Uh, I think that's a really fraught issue for them. Uh, much of the, I think, bristling at the term Asian American comes from the fact that it was originated by an older generation of writers uh, who were directly influenced by many of the sort of mass political movements of the late 60s and early 1970s. Uh, and explicitly, I think, very influenced by, by the rise of black power movements and third world liberation movements. Um, some of the early anthologies of Asian American literature, probably the most well known is a book called Ai, uh, which is explicitly political and imagines uh, Asian American literature as a sort of a political act 
to write that kind of literature. It really, you know, makes explicit gestures uh, to a lot of the radical movements that are happening at that time. But even within that cohort of writers, that earlier cohort of writers who are first using the term Asian American literature, there's a lot of disagreement about what literature should be. You know, how directly should you be engaged with it? Uh, are you a part of an avant-garde, or are you simply seeking to represent the community as it is? Um, how much should, should your work be sort of legitimately representative in a realist vein? Or how much of it should be uh, experimental, really breaking up old ways of seeing? You know, there's a lot of debate there. Um, some of it actually quite painful. Uh, some of the most famous literary debates of that cohort probably took place between Frank Chin and Maxine Hong Kingston. And they also revolve around gender as much as it does about race. Uh, but in any case, there is wide agreement in that cohort that there's something really important about writing literature that should be connected to one's experiences as an Asian American, that should be connected to the struggles around racial justice that were taking place at that time. Um, and, and that saw literature as deeply engaged in a larger political movement. I think what you see in the younger cohort is uh, more of a kind of intense debate around that premise, should literature be political? Some people do believe very strongly that it should be. Others feel um, that too overt a commitment to the political will limit what they can say. Um, and so I think those debates get looped through the tension between the, the younger cohort and the older cohort of writers. Still on the topic of, of themes, you point out in your book that the term Asian American covers a lot of diverse countries with a lot of very different cultures. Still, are there themes that recur in the hundred titles that you've studied uh, that are clearly identifiable as being, in some very real sense, Asian American? I think uh, certainly... The one way in which they, I think this term recurs is the sense that uh, the forms, the literary form that uh, the writers I studied uh, have received, studied in school, you know, the, the classic works and so on, that, they, that these forms don't quite give them the tools they need to tell the stories they want to tell. And so there's always a kind of bristling at the received forms, um, what I describe as a kind of restlessness in their literature. Uh, and so uh, constantly breaking genre expectations, uh, starting off as a work of like kind of conventional realist narrative and then suddenly jumping off into weird tangents of, uh, of like popular genre. Uh, some writers are really explicit about what they are doing, uh, experimenting with multiple narrators, multiple points of view, uh, presenting their work as short vignettes rather than as a continuous narrative, sometimes mixing prose with poetry, uh, with writing exercises, uh, sometimes putting in pictures, uh, cartoons even. Uh, there is just this desire to disrupt what they've learned, you know, as kind of the liter literary enterprise. Uh, and I think even in the more conventional seeming works, there's still this sort of discomfort with the form and, and always sort of moving in sort of interestingly erratic, unexpected ways. Um, I think that's a kind of a characteristic of the literature I'm looking at that I think is uh, uniquely Asian American. The, the, that stems from the sense, I think, uh, that unlike other literary traditions, because 
while we certainly do have some works now that are considered classics of Asian American literature, it doesn't have the, the heft or the weight of other traditions, certainly not Euro-American traditions, um, certainly not African-American literary traditions. Uh, it's not quite as salient. Uh, and so there's more of a sense among the writers that they're kind of forced to make things up, right? How do you write out of a, um, out of a kind of a lack of literary history? You know, I think in many ways writing is always a, a kind of conversation with what came before. But if you are part of a tradition where there wasn't much that came before, if that you have a series of what I call lost books or lost manuscripts, you know, uh, the onus is on you, I think, to really, you know, try to piece together some kind of tradition that enables you to tell the kind of stories you do. And I think that's actually very uniquely Asian American. Min, you write about the strong expectations that young Asian Americans are often invested with and the serious challenges that they sometimes face. Can you elaborate? Because Asian Americans have been depicted so often as this sort of uniformly successful group, which is not always true, but that's the way they've been depicted, right? From the whiz kids of the 1980s to these sort of brilliant college students uh, in the 1990s to becoming sort of, uh, uh, you know, scientists and lawyers and doctors, uh, being sort of professionally successful economically, doing well in school. Um, the, there is the, the sense that if you're Asian American, this is what you're supposed to do, right? So what if you're not good at math or science? What if you're not good at school? Uh, you're, you're led to believe somehow that you failed. Um, it robs lots of Asian Americans of their individuality, of the, you know, I think of the opportunities for them to sort of define who they are. Um, it certainly makes it difficult to, uh, uh, you know, for them to become legible in other ways, uh, like athletes. You're starting to get a little inkling of that, right? But, you know, what makes a figure like Jeremy Lin so extraordinary is not just because he's a good basketball player, but because there aren't that many Asian American basketball players. Uh, so you get kind of typecast. And then you're kind of expected to follow that type. And if you don't, you know, you're seen as a kind of oddball. Well, I think this puts an enormous pressure on people. Uh, and uh, as I said in the book, uh, what this means is that uh, there are, you're, you suffer from a lot of expectations one way, and then a lack of expectations in other ways, right? Well, not much concern for what you are like as an individual. Uh, I think one thing that happens for Asian Americans is that they are seen as part of a group. Uh, and so it's really hard to really name individuals. Uh, we have an Asian American scholarship for undergraduates here at BC. Uh, it's part of a series of scholarships we have. We have one for, ask, uh, for African Americans, one for Latinos. Um, the other scholarships have had a name for a long time, and it's only been recently that we've had a name for the scholarship here. It's now known as the Benino and Corazon Aquino Scholarship. It's a pretty good scholarship. I've worked on the committee for a long time. Um, but the process was painful to choose that name, you know. Uh, and uh, it took a lot of work for us to generate names of prominent Asian Americans who could have fit the bill. There's no immediate figure, right? There's no, no name that is comparable to, say, like Martin Luther King amongst the Asian Americans. It's not to say that there haven't been extraordinary Asian Americans in the past. It's just that their names aren't remembered. They're not known. Uh, we came up with a list of many names, but many people didn't know them. 
they seemed slight somehow or forgettable. Um, and then I think it's telling that we ended up naming the scholarship after a really, I think, important and prominent politician in the Philippines, but not an Asian American, someone who lives in the U.S., you know. Uh, so there's that sense of anonymity. One final thing I want to say about expectations is that, you know, it's not that having expectations is bad. In some ways, I think not having any expectations is worse <laughs> than having some where people just don't think you have much potential in you to do much of anything, right? It's not a matter of complaining about it or, you know, or, or feeling resentful about it. It's just acknowledging, you know, that all of us uh, have different sets of expectations or lack of expectations placed on us that all of us are differentiated by race as well as by a bunch of other things. And to think through what it means to live that kind of particularity and the kind of expectations that are generated around that particularity. You know, uh, in a way, I, I, you know, I, I really believe it's important to acknowledge difference. It's often so hard to do because I think people feel defensive about it. I mean, you wrote most of the book in the third person. Then in the final chapter, you wrote in the first person, thereby introducing a more autobiographical component. Why did you make the change? There's a couple of reasons I did that. The first reason is I noticed um, there's just this tendency in the humanities and literary scholarship to really write in the first person. Um, uh, which I think is marvelous in some ways. But it does also encourage a kind of autobiographical vein in the writing. Um, and I was just curious to see what happens when you don't do that. So I really wanted to set off the contrast between writing a book in a more traditional third-person style, very sort of almost objective-sounding, uh, and then, and then by concluding with a more first-person autobiographical narrative, really bringing that contrast out. The other reason I did it uh, is a is a more of a personal reason. That is, um, uh, you know, uh, not only am I writing about a significant literary phenomena, but I'm also writing about a cohort of people to which more or less I belong. You know, my own family. Uh, immigrated to the United States from Korea when I was five years old, 1975. I just dated myself. Uh, you know, uh, and so, you know, the generation of writers that I'm writing about is very much my own generation. And I wanted to have a little distance from them. So doing it in the third, writing it in the third person allowed me to gain that kind of distance that I could write critically about the material that I was looking at. But then writing the last chapter in the first person gave me the opportunity to acknowledge my own personal investment in this topic and to think through my own place in the story that I was writing about. Maybe a difficult question. Do you have a particularly favorite Asian-American writer? And if so, why do you like him or her? Oh, I think uh, there's so many writers, <laughs> it's very easy to overlook or forget some of them. But, you know, I, I really liked most of the work, or almost all of the works I looked at, you know, to one degree or another. Certainly, there's really prominent Asian American writers who deservedly gain the attention that they gain. Um, Jhumpa Lahiri, uh, Han Ong, uh, Susan Choi, Chang Wei Li. Um, those writers come immediately to mind as people who are doing just really adventurous, serious work, uh, who very much deserve the attention they receive and probably more attention than they're getting. And there's a whole cohort of sort of lesser known, maybe younger writers, uh, who, who I think are doing this really great, quirky, interesting work. Sabina Murray is one. Uh, Ed Park is another. Um, there's several more, just they're not rolling off the top of my head. Um, also, Sahir Alam, who I mentioned already, I think she's really fabulous. Um, 
just really, really good stuff. Uh, and also, I have to say, I'm really, really fond of the graphic narratives I looked at. Uh, Jean Yang, Adrian Tamani, uh, I think two of the really most prominent of these, uh, doing just incredibly interesting things with a medium that seems childish, but yet they are able to make it tackle some really difficult adult issues in sort of surprisingly sophisticated ways. Min, is there anything you'd like to add in conclusion? Um, one thought I I'd, I'd maybe would want to throw out there uh, is 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 also to that when I wrote this book, I think um, I make an argument that says paying attention to race actually is enabling for these writers that it, it actually is a source of creativity. And it felt to me really important to make that point because I think so much of the national conversation keeps turning back to questions of race. And yet we're always in such denial about it, you know? Uh, there's such an emphasis on sort of being colorblind not noticing racial difference. Uh, it feels almost as if to notice racial difference is to make yourself a racist. Or to talk about race in public is to be almost criminal, like we're criminalizing discussions about race. And I think this takes an extraordinary toll on our ability as a country to talk about some really difficult issues that face us. And I feel it's really important for us to say, you know, there's a painful history that racial difference speaks to. Uh, but uh, if we refuse to talk about it, if we refuse to see sort of what is sort of creatively possible in talking about it, uh, we end up becoming more divided. We end up not being able to really address some of the really important issues facing us. Um, I don't think it's good for the country. So that was part of what I was thinking about as I try to insist on it. Uh, 